Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 18th of September. As always, I have the chapters down the bottom so you can jump to a particular update you care about more than any of the others. New videos this week. I created a video all about staying safe online. Just some general tips about interactions with the web, with email, types of phishing attacks you might see. Then a super quick video on how do I quickly find out the creation time of a VM, a virtual machine, scales out a dedicated host, a capacity reservation uh, through the RESTful API. Also, you can use the resource graph, so I, I go through that in this video. In terms of updates on the compute side, so now Azure Dedicated Host supports Ultradisk. So remember, Azure Dedicated Host lets me buy out the entire capacity of a node, a server in Azure Data Center of a certain SKU. And then I can fill that with the corresponding VM SKU of different sizes up to the capacity of that box. That means I'm not sharing the underlying hardware with another tenant. It also gives me more flexibility on things like maintenance windows. Well, now I can use Ultradisk with that. Remember, Ultradisk is the lowest latency, most performant type of managed disk available. It also lets me independently set the capacity IOPS and throughput, and that IOPS and throughput can actually be dynamically changed while it's in use. So I can only pay for the performance I need at different times of whatever seasonality I have, day, hour, whatever. Azure App Service, uh, the GRPC support. I think I've talked about this before, but basically it lets me use the remote procedure called Framework. So messages between my client and my server can leverage HTTP2. That's really good for things like multiplexing, to send multiple parallel requests over that same connection. So that's available for Linux workloads on App Service. And now the Azure Container Registry has soft delete. So once I enable this on the registry, if I delete some artifact, well, I can bring it back from a recycle bin for whatever configurable amount of time I configured that. Now, after that time, it gets purged and I can't bring it back. For the Azure Kubernetes service, now the Network Policy Manager is available for Windows Server 2022 nodes. Obviously, AKS supports Linux nodes and Windows nodes of different versions. And the Network Policy Manager is a managed solution to drive network policy. For example, I wanna be able to control communication between the various pods. Another option is something like Calico. But now, hey, that AKS MPM, I can use on my server 2022 nodes. AKS now has an abort operation. So if I was performing some type of operation on the nodes, on, for example, the, the cluster, and it's stuck. Maybe it's a long running, it's taking too long. I can now, as a last resort, do this abort. Now, it may impact the cluster health, but this is now available to me. And AKS now supports these multi-instance GPUs. So this is all based around the A100 GPU, and what this lets me do is partition it. So I have this GPU, but depending on the policy I select, I can split it into a certain number of instances, partitions, that I can then use in the pods on that AKS node. So now multiple pods can leverage these GPU capabilities based on whatever profile I configure. On the networking side, so AKS has now this Azure CNI overlay in preview. And if we think about AKS, so Kubernetes does not have a native uh, networking interface. I have to use something. So we have KubeNet and we have the Azure CNI. KubeNet uses a separate IP space for the pods. With Azure CNI, it uses IP addresses for the pods directly from the virtual network on which I deploy my AKS nodes. Well, that can be a challenge because maybe I just have limited IP space. So what this Azure CNI lets me do is if I think about all the nodes themselves, they're still deployed into my virtual network. So the nodes still have IPs from my VNet. So maybe this is a 192.168.10.4. 
and this is a 192.168.10.5, whatever that might be. Then you have a bunch of pods. And ordinarily, these pods would take an IP address from the same uh, subnet, or I can do dynamic pod IP allocation where they have a different subnet, but it's still getting IP addresses directly from the virtual network. Well, what I can now do with this overlay, I can specify a different side range that's nothing to do with the virtual network at all. So I could pick a 10, I mean, I'm just gonna pick a big one, let's say 16. And what happens is each node gets a slash 24 from that range. So maybe this is 10.0.0 slash 24, 10.0.1 slash 24, and then the pods will get an IP address from that range. Maybe this is dot uh, 2, dot 3, dot 4, so 10.0.0.2, three, dot 4, and this would be, hey, 10.0.1.2.3. So now it's a completely separate IP range it then has to snap. So if it's talking externally from the AKS cluster, obviously then I have to snap the traffic because these would not be directly usable from anything external. But within the cluster, these can all talk directly to each other. And the biggest benefit here you have over KubeNet, because KubeNet, like, well, doesn't that do the same thing? Remember KubeNet, the way it functions behind the scenes, it has to use user-defined routes. Well, there's a limit of 400 routes. And if so that means 400 nodes is my maximum. If it's dual stack, then that's 200 nodes. Well, with this, it's using a completely different mechanism. I can go to thousands and thousands of nodes within a particular cluster. So those scale limitations and maybe the complexities of using those user-defined routes that I have with KubeNet goes away when I use the Azure CNI overlay. So this is a, a nice new feature that is in preview. I think it's Linux nodes only today. Um, also on AKS, it now has API server VNet integration. So I guess if I got that same picture up, if we think about the nodes, well, the nodes have things like the kubelet. It has things like the, the cake proxy. So the number of components we have that talk to the control plane of Kubernetes. So somewhere floating out there when we think of AKS and Kubernetes in general, well, there's things like the etcd database, there's the scheduler, and there's the API server. And it's the API server that a lot of these things talk to. Well, one option is it's a public endpoint. That's not done very often. So the other option, historically, is remember these all sit on a, a virtual network, so we have this VNet, is I could create a private endpoint. So if I create a private AKS cluster, we get a private endpoint that points to the API server. So we go over that private endpoint. What this new VNet integration for the API server does is, well, I don't need that anymore. Instead, what happens is in a particular, basically we delegate a subnet, but there's a load balancer sitting here, that is the API server. So now there's a front end IP from my virtual network that these can just go and directly communicate an IP, it's not using DNS, just directly talks to that front end IP address, which is the API server. So I don't have to use a private endpoint anymore. My API server now integrates into my virtual network into um, that delegated subnet. So now it's a, a simpler um, deployment and integration for AKS into my VNet. So that is also in preview. And just for regular virtual networks, as you know, we often peer virtual networks that enables them to directly communicate. They don't have to go via any kind of VPN. They cannot have overlapping IP ranges. And also once I peered them, I couldn't change the IP space, the size or additional spaces of a VNet. With this functionality, I can now resize, I can modify the IP space of a virtual network without having to remove any peers. So now I can just change them, um, and that is now GA. Storage side, standard network features for Azure NetApp files is basically continuing to grow into more regions. 
When a user as an app files and it integrates with a virtual network, there's a basic mode, which limits a lot of network functionality. Or there's now the standard mode. So with the standard mode, hey, I can have increased number of IPs in the VNet, I can use user-defined routes, I can use network security groups, I can connect over VPN and express route fast path. So it's now like 20 regions support those standard network features with Azure NetApp files. Encrypt managed disks with cross-tenant customer managed keys. So I think it was last week or the week before, we talked about I can now do customer managed keys for storage account encryption with cross-tenant. Well, now I can do it for managed disks. So managed disks, I want to bring my own key, I create a disk encryption set and create the managed disks in that disk encryption set. The disk encryption set uses a key from our Azure Key Vault. Well, now that disk encryption set can use a key from a cross-tenant Key Vault. And again, a big deal here is, hey, maybe I'm some SaaS provider, my customer wants to keep control of the key that I'm using to encrypt disks that have their data on it. So now, hey, that's in preview. And Azure Backup now supports reserved capacity. So I can get cheaper, prices for my Azure backup storage if I do a one or a three year commit. On the database side, MySQL Flexible, remember that's the VM based version of MySQL and Postgres, burstable VMs, stop, start, automatic HA, a lot more configuration of the parameters and, and more benefits there. Well, MySQL Flexible now has major version update. So in the past to move between major versions, we had to spin up a new version and migrate the data across. Now, hey, in preview, they've got that ability to do an in-place major version update. Today it's 5.7 to 8, and it's a click of a button. I think there is some downtime, depending on the size of database, um, but that's now in preview. MySQL Flexible Customer Managed Key. So now my MySQL Flexible, I can encrypt with my own key. That means that I get to control the rotation of that key. The way this actually works is the customer controls a key encryption key that is used to encrypt the data encryption key. So I get control of that key encryption key, goes in my key vault, I have all the control of that. MySQL Flexible now has read replica in GA. This is an, an asynchronous replication using the native binary log, so bin log um, based replication. I think I can have up to 10 of these read replicas. And this is really useful if I have a lot of read-only workloads, maybe analytical workloads. So I don't want to hit my main engine, but I can have read replicas and run my analytical, my read workloads against those. And now PostgreSQL Flexible has a fast restore. I can basically just pick a certain restore point and restore it to a brand new server. It's going to give me a very fast, very predictable restore process. Miscellaneous Visual Studio now has bicep support. So not VS Code, VS Code has had it for a while. Visual Studio now has bicep support. So it's an extension. If we go over here, we can kind of see that quickly. So my bicep for Visual Studio, hey, requires Visual Studio 17.3. It is focused today just on the authoring. So we think things like uh, snippets and tab completions, errors and warnings. Uh, I can think about hovering over to get information, highlighting, formatting, but it's not doing the deployment, it's not doing the visualization of those resources. Uh, that will probably come in time, but that's where it is today. But if you're using Bicep, remember Bicep is the new declarative technology that's Azure specific. To say, hey, this is what I want my Azure resources to look like, make it so. It's a lot easier to use than the ARM JSON based format. Built in Azure Monitor Alerts for Azure Backup, and I know I've talked about this before, but basically now if I go into Backup Center, I can go and migrate my alerts to native Azure Monitor. It's gonna recommend ones I should have for key scenarios, things like, hey, job failures, um, security related incidents, but because it's integrated with Azure Monitor, I can use the Azure Monitor Action Groups. So all those different alerting options. I can use Logic Apps, Azure Functions, hooks into many other types of systems. So it's just a, a much more powerful, integrated, scalable solution than the old classic uh, backup alerts we had. And on the monitoring side, so action groups and metric-based alerts are now available in new regions. 
So the whole point about this is when I go and create these, I can now create them, for example, in Sweden Central and Germany West Central, in addition to global regions. It's when I save the action group, where the metadata goes, where the processing goes, I can now make sure it stays in Europe. So that's really the big deal. So the action groups, Sweden Central and Germany West Central. For the metric alerts, it's North Europe, West Europe, Sweden Central and Germany West Central. So again, the metadata and the processing, making sure it stays in Europe. And then monitoring of ARM-based VMs. Remember, this is the new uh, type of virtual machines available in Azure, not Intel or AMD-based ARM, which tends to have, uh, they're cheaper, but I can get very good performance through them. Now I can get, for those VM and AKS nodes, um, insight type abilities for them. So I get VM insights, I can get the AKS container insights through um, the metrics through the data that it can gather. So even for if I'm using ARM, I can still get that insight. And that's it. Uh, as always, I hope this was useful and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.